Hello, it's Scott Manley here with episode 3 of Kerbal Asteroid Defense. Now, in episode 1, we put a space telescope up uh, near EVE. This was going to be a clone of the uh, Sentinel mission, which was a concept by the B612 Foundation to find uh, asteroids that could hit the Earth. And indeed, in episode 2, we added such an asteroid using the magic of save file editing. It will hit the planet in about 12,000 Kerbal days or 3,000 Earth days. And so now in episode three, we're going to send up a spacecraft to rendezvous with this. And we're going to use the Soyuz launcher here from Bobcat's uh, Soviet pack. Now, there's a bunch of different spacecraft in this pack, but I like the original Soyuz because the Soyuz is such an iconic vehicle of uh, the space you know, exploration. Uh, I think it has flown more than any other spacecraft, something like 1,500, 1,600 times uh, the, the still flies. Originally built uh, in 1966 and is still going. That means that in a few years' time it will be 50 years old and pretty much flying with small tweaks to the design. Uh, you know, Korolev's original design shows up, has a lot of good ideas, like the way the, the liquid boosters are strapped on the side and they fall off. You know, this whole idea of building sideways rather than upwards is something you commonly see in Kerbal designs simply because we have different aerodynamics. But there we go with external boosters dropping away. They are liquid fueled. The central core is also liquid fueled and it will carry us most of the way into orbit with a stage sitting above that and inside the payload shroud we actually have the interplanetary stage which will have to go out and uh, match orbits with this chunk of rock which is heading towards the planet Kerbin in its date with destiny. Now we, you might think given the threat that is posed that we are sending up a spacecraft to destroy this asteroid or to divert it or something. No, the first thing you would do when you found a spacecraft or a threat to the Earth, given enough time, you want to send up missions to actually analyze it first. You want to know everything you can about this object before you decide to take any action, assuming you have the luxury of time. If you attack it or deal with it the wrong way, you can make the situation worse. If you blow up a large object and split it into smaller pieces, they can cause more damage. Now, there we go. That's us again yeah, knocking off the shrouds there. I had a, I had a nose cone attached in the form of the escape system, but uh, well, you wouldn't need an escape system on a, an unmanned mission. We're not sending a manned mission out into deep space. So there we go. There kicks in the upper stage. We're gonna burn this a little more and yeah just kick ourselves away from the debris and now uh, we'll tell it bring up the autopilot and circularize this um yeah you can see the the well the shrouding is a little um roomy let's say i tried a few different designs but this was the one that i came up with i tried the strap-on tanks and they were just the right size but the the problem was the strap-ons needed too many um too many fuel lines for it to be weight efficient. So this is what I came up with in the end. And on top we've got a space probe with a, a secondary object added. So yeah, to get out what you see that I've put this onto a polar orbit, because we're going into an inclined orbit, we wanted to start in a polar orbit and essentially thrust downwards so that we match inclination with the target orbit. It's very important on this initial injection to try and match inclinations as efficiently as possible. Because as we all know, inclination changes take a lot of delta V. You can see uh, I cut out about 20 minutes of tweaking the orbit here using uh, MechJeb's maneuver node editor, basically punching in numbers back and forth until I get an orbit that's relatively close to what I want. And once that's there, well, I actually decide to fly it more or less manually. <laughs> I pretty much give up with my maneuver node, but I set it up so at least it has the timing. Uh, basically, I'm going to burn prograde. I'm going to start slightly early. There we go. And start burning. And this is where it's going to take a whole bunch of time because we have to pick up about three kilometers per second. The spacecraft itself has a something like a six kilometers per second delta v in this upper stage and that's including fuel in the the interplanetary booster stage so we've reached escape velocity now this stage is going to be used for actually rendezvousing and then the final stage is for maneuvering once we're at the target 
So yeah, you watch we're, we're bur basically burning and accelerating up and you can see the orbit is kind of coming down so it's starting to align more closely with the target orbit. I just remove the maneuver node at this point. I want to just keep going until the orbits are pretty closely aligned. And then once we're in deep space, we're going to continue to actually make the rendezvous happen. So we arrive at the same point in the same time. This is probably not the most efficient uh, way to do this. There, I mean, as in, there are w definitely more efficient ways to do this to make sure you arrive and need the, the least delta V, but I have the luxury of having lots of delta V and the problem of not actually having a team of astro navigation experts at hand to plug in all the values to the computer and optimize my pork chop plots. Mmm, pork chops. Yeah, so we got ourselves in. We're gonna, first thing we're gonna do is adjust our inclination to make it exactly the same. That's about a 50 meters per second delta V maneuver. And that gets us close. We're already within like one degree. Now, next, we're gonna set up a maneuver node just past this to adjust our period slightly so that we arrive really close to our target. And what I'm going to do is just punch numbers into the maneuver node editor and mouse over the approach distance until I get this thing down to something that I can actually handle. Once I get close enough, it'll be uh, it'll be a whole lot easier. Let's say once you get close enough in deep space, it's more or less a case of pointing at the target and burning. But we want to get our initial encounter as close as possible because if you've seen previous uh, videos moving around the um, moving around the asteroid, we found that when you do time acceleration, it can cause the asteroid to skip, you know, several kilometers in different directions because of precision errors in the internal orbit plotting. But there we go. We, we set up a, I set up my maneuver node, get it as close as I can using, you know, steps of 0.1 meters per second. That's one centimeter per second. That's pretty darn slow. It's not as slow as a snail, but it's, you know, most bugs don't go that fast. Or a lot of bugs go about that speed. So, yeah, we're just going to ask the maneuver, uh, the autopilot, to actually perform that maneuver that I so carefully planned. And next, well, we wait until we're about 10 days out from the target. We perform a tiny, tiny course correction that brings our orbit down from about 100 kilometer close approach to 10 kilometers. And now that we've got our 10 kilometer close approach, we, we set the maneuver planner to say match velocities with target at closest approach to target. And then you just click autopilot and watch it go off and do its stuff. You see, it's already lined up around along its axis, so you can see where it's gonna come in. There we go. Look, in all the depths of space, in deep interplanetary space, I've successfully rendezvoused with a target. Eh, not bad, huh? Uh, of course, I used a little bit of autopilot here and there, but uh, you know, none of these things were all the maneuvers I planned by hand. If you notice, I didn't go out and um, I didn't go out and ask it to do anything except for this final close approach, which again you've seen me do like a million times. So there we go. Now we're we're about 15 kilometers out. We're gonna you know burn slowly towards this, and this is where it's gonna take a whole lot of patience because we don't want to use time acceleration. You see me using physical time acceleration, and that that makes it move. There's something weird that when you're using physical time acceleration, the object, the asteroid, which is 500 meters across, becomes invisible. I don't know what's causing that, and it would be really nice when the game actually gets proper asteroids. Nova Solisco has published an asteroid and a challenge which I need to kind of get around to doing because you know there's only so much time and these challenges become stale don't they and all these other people will be doing it and wondering why I haven't and the reason is I've had a lot of stuff going on at home like you know rebuilding the entire thing rebuilding the entire house yeah so anyway we are gonna come in and get as close to this thing as possible uh, Another very important reason to send a mission up is to put a transponder on the surface, to basically get a very exact view of the thing, not just the shape of it, the composition, the color. We need to actually track its motion really accurately. If you look at some of these, some objects have solutions where they will hit the Earth in a thousand years' time. But because of accuracy of their positional estimates, their end body, uh, you know, end body unknowns, basically, you can't say that for sure. 
So if there was an object that had a serious chance of hitting the Earth, right, and you, you probably wouldn't absolutely know for a long time, one of the best things you can do is either get a radar uh, sounding on it, a radar echo, that gives you an exact distance, or you can actually fly a spacecraft and have it put a transponder on the surface. So not only can you measure the spacecraft's position accurately, you can measure the asteroid and therefore forevermore know exactly how close it's going to land or exactly how close it's going to go. And this gets even more important when you consider that objects that are Earth potential Earth colliders, when they pass near to the Earth, their orbits get changed quite a lot. So knowing these changes is very important. So here we go. We have a little lander type spacecraft that is attached to the main spacecraft. You notice that I've left the whole interplanetary booster tank attached. Um, when I originally tried this mission, I didn't have enough Delta V, so I kind of redesigned the mission a little, added that extra tank, and now I've got too much fuel in that tank. I was. <laughs> it's either too much or too little. Anyway, so this thing has no gravity because it's just a, a model. So we're basically going to have to point ourselves down towards the surface and more or less, uh, you know, more or less fly into it and put our landing gear down. The, um, yeah, the asteroid, you can actually get a part, I believe, a part gravity, which will give it gravity. Uh, I've used that in the past, but I found that it does have a nasty habit of just like randomly exploding or randomly causing spacecrafts to explode or just spinning up like a crazy whirling dervish. This one seems to be a little more stable, but it doesn't have gravity. But that's okay. So we're just going to... I've just thrust it towards the surface, and I'm uh, adjusting my... I'm just pointing it the right way around now. You see, this is a very simple spacecraft. It just has a few... It just basically has a probe body and fuel tank, a couple of solar cells to make sure that it doesn't run out and become marooned in space. Uh, and it has those transmitters, which will, of course, be transmitting back to the parent spacecraft. The parent spacecraft will take that very important astrometric, radiometric data and send it back to the planet Kerbin so that their scientists can analyze it um, and decide what action to take, what of the many possible ways of dealing with a threat. Uh, so here we go, coming down 100 and, you know, 380, I guess. We're, this asteroid's supposed to be 500 meters across, so 250 is presumably the sea level indicator. Uh, also note that while we're doing this, we are actually flying at you know nine kilometers per second, and I've pretty much matched velocities to, with this thing to within you know one thousandth or or one yeah all, almost one hundredth of a percentile, which just isn't so bad actually. Of course. The, the model isn't quite perfect, and the collision mesh apparently doesn't actually match the object itself. Watch as I'm coming down here. At some point, 1.2 meters per second. I'm not sure what I'm going to hit here. 1.1, so I'm killing the velocity just very slowly because I don't want to bounce off too fast. Because after all, when you time accelerate, you're going to then find yourself you know, drifting away at 0.1 meters per second, which may not seem like much... But uh, over a day, it's a long, long way. There we go. I think that's us. Essentially, we, we've touched it according to the game engine. Um, yeah, so much for collision detection. Well, still, you can see based on the shadow where I am, where the surface will be. And from that, you can make some further estimates of where the spacecraft needs to be. So now we have this mission, or the rendezvous has happened, we've put the transponder on the surface, communications link is set up, our instruments are analysing scientifically. The science is to be done and we shall decide what to do to save the planet Kerbin from the threat of the giant rubber asteroid. No, seriously, part four, we're going to look into ways we can actually deal with an asteroid, but until then, I am Scott Manley. Fly safe.